Right now, if you currently have one client that's past due, you could be using QuickFee to get the immediate benefit of freeing up that cash flow. Stay tuned to hear more from our sponsor, QuickFee, later in this episode. This episode of the Cloud Accounting Podcast is sponsored by Accounting Suite. Accounting Suite offers exceptional cloud accounting software that includes a robust set of inventory management tools to track inventory levels, orders, sales, and deliveries from anywhere at any time. Accounting Suite even handles multi-channel online sales. In one integrated dashboard, you can control inventory, orders, and sales across various stores at the same time to avoid product outages and lost sales. Accounting Suite lets you start out with just the features you need today, and as your business grows and needs change, you'll have the peace of mind knowing that Accounting Suite offers an upgradable path for your firm and company's future. Accounting Suite is offering Cloud Accounting Podcast listeners 50% off forever by using promo code CAP underscore 50 underscore 2020. Head over to cloudaccountingpodcast.promo slash ASUITE. That is cloudaccountingpodcast.promo forward slash A-S-U-I-T-E. This episode of the Cloud Accounting Podcast is sponsored by OnPay. OnPay is an easy-to-use, full-service payroll that's the right fit for all your clients, whether they have just one or 500 employees. They handle all the complicated stuff like agricultural payrolls, Form 943, multi-state, and H-2A visas. OnPay even makes it easy to switch from other payroll services by doing all the data entry for each client that you set up. Right now, Cloud Accounting Podcast listeners can get three free months of OnPay payroll service. To learn more, head over to cloudaccountingpodcast.promo slash OnPay. That is cloudaccountingpodcast.promo forward slash O-N-P-A-Y. Welcome to the Cloud Accounting Podcast. I'm Blake Oliver. And I'm David Leary. Blake, I saw you're doing some traveling. You're in Dallas? I escaped. I got out of Dallas before the big storm hit, and I was there for the Sage Accountants Advisory Council. This is my first year being on that council. Who did I see that was there? Uh, Garrett Wagner? Garrett Wagner. We recorded a little LinkedIn video about our takeaways from the conference. Um, Trevor McCandless was there. Got to see Ed Kless, who was presenting on behalf of Sage, and Raphael uh, was there from Sage as well. And obviously, some of it's probably private, but like, what was the gist of the event? Yeah, I can't recall exactly like what I'm, you know, these NDAs, what I, <laughs> what I can say, what I can't. Uh, but basically, they were presenting what they plan to do with the Sage Partner Program over the next year and some different options and wanted to get feedback from the partners. But I, I am not a Sage user, so you might be wondering like why what was I doing at that event? And I think Well that well, could be valuable, right? <laughs> like like why like why don't you use Sage products? That could right. be a good question to ask, right? That yeah, makes sense. Yeah. So uh, well at my previous firm we were big Sage Intact partners. Now Sage Intact and Sage North America still are not combined. They're still separate groups in many respects. So what I was hearing about was the partner program for applications such as Sage Cloud Accounting. I think the full name is Sage Business Cloud Accounting, Sage 50, Sage 100. The partners who were there who are actual users and big partners of Sage North America are mostly those who have you know, 200 clients on Sage 50 or okay. Sage 50. So when, you, yeah. so when you had your uh, bookkeeping practice, mm -hmm. I remember you said you kind of started on QuickBooks Desktop, but then you discovered Zero and you're doing Zero Cloud stuff. Did you have any Sage clients back then? I never used the Sage Cloud product, but it was different at that time. It was called Sage One, and it did not have a reputation of being very good. They killed that product, so now there's a new one. But even the Sage Desktop products, you didn't. So I had a client on Mass Ninety, I think was what it was called, which is a very old version of what is now Sage. 100, I think I could be wrong about that, but yeah, it's, it's basically in the same family. Okay. And I ended up converting that client not to a Sage Cloud product, but to Zero uh, in the past. But so I know the product that I was working with, at least an older version of it. And by the way, these products used to also be called Peachtree, was the big one that I think became Sage 50. I, but but again, <laughs> I'm very ignorant about this. So I think it, most people at Sage can't keep track of it. I mean, they've made so many acquisitions over time. So many products right, of, of yeah. different, yeah, so many products. Like it's very very hard. So for me, to, for anybody, to, yeah, it was great learning. Like because I I was very ignorant about especially the on-prem products, which are still very big, right? There's still a lot of users on those products and the plans to you know get people to move to cloud and give partners both cloud and desktop options for their clients. So uh, it was great, and uh, thank you to Sage North America for bringing me out there, and it was. Again, I, I go to these events for the opportunity to hang out with other accountants because I work at home. I'm in my home office, right? This was great. We went out to amazing barbecue. 
I had the best brisket at Hard Eight. Uh, it was the name of this barbecue place that we went to in Dallas. And it was like, you go in there and you come out smelling like barbecue. <laughs> oh, that's the best barbecue joint. Because <laughs> it's just best. a pit. Yes. And you wait in line to go to the pit and just get what you want. So that was really cool. We don't have that in Southern California as far as I know. No. I'm oh. a little jealous. I'm a little jealous. So um, the, the brisket is pouring out of my pores. The smell of barbecue is still on me and I'm ready to talk about what's new in cloud, cloud accounting. I don't have a lot of articles, but I have some good ones. Um, maybe one big story to tease is, uh, remember all our talk about free file? Yes, we got to do follow up on free file. There's follow up on that. Uh, there's some news on that came out. And then I have some small kind of a funny follow up on, remember PayPal bought that app, Honey, uh -huh. the browser extension. I have a little follow up on that that I think is uh, interesting, kind of uh, funny. What about you? I have lots of news about tax season and the IRS, which is very appropriate. Uh, 1099s, a survey from Accounting Web that's very interesting. Follow up about the California privacy law. Facebook lost something like 30,000 employees' personal information. <laughs> that kind of ties into privacy there. So I don't know where to start. Should we start with tax right. season? Maybe that's I have, uh, actually I have some small uh, small news okay. update of what I did this week. Oh yeah, what's new? I I went to an accounting firm for the, only the second time in my whole entire life. <laughs> like to their office? <laughs> to their office. I went and uh, visited a friend that's at Beach Fleischman here in oh. Tucson. And uh, so, what was your impression? Uh, it was funny. He actually noticed I was talking like I was in a museum. Looking for the the calculators on the desks and stuff like that. Uh, no, it didn't. Um, it it felt like a typical company office environment, mm -hmm. but they're a little bit more forward thinking. Like they they built their the buildings at Beach Fleischman. They're leasing out the whole bottom floor. Like a bank is leasing space from them in the building, right? And so, and then the the something called the Sun Corridor, which is like a technology leadership, almost like a commerce. Uh, like how the cities have commerce centers trying to bring business in the city. It's kind of like that. And I think it's a collaboration between Phoenix and Tucson. They call that the Sun Corridor to bring, you know, all these California companies, right? They're luring them away from California. They rent space there. So it's, it's a little bit more forward thinking of a firm. But yeah, so I just thought it was funny that I was, I was in the lobby and I was like, this is the second time I've ever been in an accounting firm. <laughs> And I've been I, in this space for like 20 years. That's great because you, you're always yeah. – it's not that you don't talk with lots of accountants, but you do it at conferences. Exactly. When you were into it, you went to – I mean, how many conferences did you go to every year? Lots. So so it's it's just it's just really, really funny that I've just never stepped foot in an actual accounting firm. So – Well, I'm glad you got to before they all uh, – all the physical offices disappear. Well, that's what you talked about. He's – they they a lot of people work remotely. Well, let's talk about tax season, shall we? Yeah. Tax season begins for individual filers on Monday, January 27th, 2020, when the IRS will begin accepting and processing 2019 returns. And I spotted some information from CNBC, an article in CNBC about how your chances of getting audited have fallen significantly. So David, do you want to hazard a guess about what your odds are of getting audited this year by the IRS as an individual taxpayer? Like just straight up, not like, oh, if I do the home office. Right. It just overall. I'm, it increases by X. So overall, slim to none. I, I'm it, 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 super low. Uh, <laughs> just give me, a number, give me a one third of a percentage point. One third of a percentage point. You're actually really close. The agency audited 0.45% of individual tax returns in fiscal 2019. And that's through September 30th of last year. That figure is down by more than half from what it was in 2010. So 10 years ago, slightly over 1%, 1.11% of taxpayers were audited. So in other words, you have a one in 220 chance of getting audited. And a decade ago, those odds were closer to one in 90. You may be asking, why have the odds gone down? Why have the odds gone down? <laughs> Budget cuts. And this is specifically called out by a government report. The IRS budget of $11.4 billion in 2018 is 20% less than it was in 2010 when adjusted for inflation. And meanwhile, we have more tax returns than ever. So these are the biggest budget cuts the IRS has ever had, and they've been over the past two decades. They lost nearly 30,000 full-time jobs at the IRS, including among enforcement personnel between 2010 and 2019. And to put that in perspective, they lost 30,000 people. They only employ 78,000 people right now. 
it's it seems insane because this is your revenue generating department. Yeah. <laughs> if anything, like the, the in, in in private enterprise, you'd be like, let's double the size of that department, right? Triple the size of that department. <laughs> you you you'd be investing as much as possible in that only revenue generating portion of your business. And I think there's previous reports out there that say that every dollar invested in the IRS has significant multiple times ROI. So they they should just the IRS should just go out and get some VC funding, <laughs> like like because that 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 has the opportunity to be a billion dollar return. Yeah, if we privatize right. trillion dollar, if returns. we privatize the IRS, I bet you uh, audit rates and collections would go up dramatically. Um, but there, I think we talked about this though six months ago or so that this lack of staff and lack of audits is causing like a disproportionate amount of um, low income earners getting audited because it's easier to audit them. And nobody has the time, the effort, or the skill set to audit high, uh, the one percenters who might be. Yeah. So that's yeah. actually – I'm not sure. I, I remember we talked about that before. But according to this article, that's not what's happening. Maybe it is happening within like a narrow band of income. But for mm -hmm. people who make a lot of money are much more likely to get audited. So about half a percent of people between 50 and 75,000 in income get audited. But if you make over $10 million, 6.66% of returns are audited, which is a huge difference, right? Uh, still kind of not bad odds, less than a 10% chance, closer to 5% chance of getting audited if you make over $10 million. But you know this, this all has actual real world consequences. Like you said, right? We're not collecting as much revenue. And a report from the taxpayer advocate, which is an independent branch of the IRS, has quantified that for us. So per person, per household, I should say, in the United States, it is costing each household $3,000 to subsidize taxpayers who aren't paying all they owe, according to the taxpayer advocate service. The gap between what they should be collecting and what they are collecting comes out to $3,000 per household. Basically, we're we're paying for people who are cheating. Yeah, and and the, the actual total amount of uncollected tax that they should be collecting is three hundred eighty one billion dollars on average each year from twenty eleven to twenty thirteen, which is fourteen percent of taxes never being submitted to the agency. So the, you know, it's kind of crazy that we are not funding the IRS properly. Uh, and we we should be doing it. Like to me, this is just dumb. But this is what makes America great, right? <laughs> like, 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 but, the, the, you know, we we don't fund the right. taxes. And so the <laughs> odds of getting audited are so low that cheating has very little consequence. Or so you've got very low odds of actually getting caught when you cheat, and the penalties are unless you get. Uh, accused of fraud. If you just get a penalty for, um, you know, let me find this. So the penalties are uh, there's accuracy related and there's fraud. So accuracy related, the penalty is only 20% on an underpayment of tax due to negligence or disregard of rules. So basically you can be really, really aggressive and the IRS can come back and there's a tiny chance they'll audit you. And if they do audit you, right, that 0.5% chance, they're only going to penalize you 20%. If you're just doing the numbers there, right? Uh, oh, yeah, if you could, you could run this like a hedge fund. Your your personal your 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 tax returns. Yeah, it makes and... sense to cheat. I mean, if you're unethical, it makes sense to cheat every year a little bit on different in different places because the odds that they catch you are slim. And if they do, they only penalize you twenty percent. And then if you haven't done it consistently year after year, they're probably not going to accuse you of fraud. Oh, and by the way, the penalty for fraud is only 75% of an underpayment. So even if you get accused of fraud, as long as you don't go to jail, you're only going to pay you know, 75% penalty. With the um, accuracy-related penalties, they can only go back so many years. But for fraud, they can go back forever. So you just don't want to get accused of fraud. So like that's why people are cheating so much. 14% like, of taxes never get collected. And, and I think to tie this back to previous discussion, we talked about what, what uh, was that tax uh, – retail franchise group that got in trouble. Liberty Tax. Liberty Tax. Right. So Liberty Tax, they had a bunch of their biggest franchisees doing this systematically, <laughs> cheating on taxes. 
Why would they do that? Well, because the odds of getting caught are so low and the penalties are very low. Kind of sad news about tax season, right? Because if you're an ethical accountant and you're doing things the right way, like you know that your clients are paying more than all of these clients that are, or all these tax pros who are uh, cheating, their clients are paying less. And it's sad that the situation is this way. Well, it makes it hard for you to value bill. <laughs> right? Yeah. But I do have one positive story about tax season. Okay. So this is from Ed Mendelowitz. It's an article he wrote on CPA trend lines. We've talked uh, some, about some articles that he's written in the past, uh, partnered yep. with them and very, very prolific writer. I've never seen anybody turn out so many articles every week. AI. He's the AI. <laughs> <laughs> he says that tax time, I'll just read the headline, why tax time is the best time to get new business. And he says, Tax season has always been the best time of the year for me to get new business. The reason is there is much less competition. And he says that if you are a partner or a owner of a tax firm or just want to get more business for your firm, clients who need our services, they don't care about tax season, especially if they need something right away. They don't understand why their call is being put on a queue. Uh, they don't understand that we're busy. So the best thing to do is to simply, even if you're busy, don't appear busy. Respond ASAP in your normal manner as if you weren't in tax season. And then they're happy because the other guy is not getting back to them. It's very smart. Showing up is the best way to get new business and keep an existing client happy. And I agree with that. I think way more important than tech tech or anything is just being responsive. No, that makes a lot of sense, right? Just invest in having somebody for during the busy season, just pay somebody in your staff to do nothing, but keep that front facing, we're not busy look. Yeah. Right. Even though behind the scenes, there could be a big fire, <laughs> but on that front end, but because I'm sure that you're right, they call their firms and hey, we're, we're, we can't take new clients right now. They hang, they hang up on, right? So yeah, that that's a really good strategy. That's really, really smart. So that's my tax season update for this episode. So, what else? So I think we can, I, I think we should jump into the TurboTax thing then since we've been talking tax. The free file. The free file. So uh, for those of you who've not listened to the podcast the last year. There uh, has been a lot of chatter and exposure. There's a ProPublica.org. There's a writer on ProPublica who uh, has been really digging into the free file program and really going after Intuit the most because Intuit's the biggest horse in the show. And so almost two decades ago, the tax preparers software companies, so this is the H&R Blocks and uh, Tax Slayer and Tax Cut and TurboTax. Um, and TurboTax. And there's about 20 of them. And they came to an agreement with the IRS to, hey, we will offer for lower income earners free a free service. They could use TurboTax for free. And in exchange, the IRS said, we're not going to build tax software. So this agreement was there two, two decades ago. And what happened over time at all these companies, H&R Block and Intuit, they got a little confusing in their marketing, right? Where you could get TurboTax free, but there's also this thing called TurboTax free file. And the free is like not the free file. So the free kind of pumps you into a funnel to, mm -hmm. it's like a freemium model, right? You use it for free and then you, you upgrade. It, it puts you in an upgrade channel where you're going to spend money. And the free file, you have to get to through the IRS website, through a special link. It's, it's a little bit of a dance. Very but confusing from a marketing standpoint. Very confusing. And as it's evolved over 20 years, obviously these companies got very good at understanding how to confuse people the most. And it got as far as they would hide things in search results, right? They would tell Google not to find the site. So it got it, it got a little ugly and it got exposed by ProPublica. And what this has resulted in is there's a new deal. So the IRS has came out and said that if they want to create something, they can. Now, Blake just said they don't have any resources, so it probably <laughs> won't happen. But but they they can do that. That that's off the table. And the other thing, they specifically expressed that they bar them from um, engaging in any practices that hides this. Right, can't put that code on your site that um, hides it from Google or any other search engine. And what I noticed um, just between social media and some blogs, like and even a commercial from H and R Block, the, all these companies are going out of their way to really drive people to the correct products. I think I saw TurboTax said they were uh, military families. Uh, is free, I think. And don't comment on this. You see these things come through in social media, but they, there, there's a reaction to this investigation that took place the last eight or nine months for this tax. Yeah. Season. And I saw another article about this uh, on accounting today, just recently, about how these vendors have agreed to 
redirect taxpayers to the correct fee file, free file program at the earliest feasible point in the preparation process if they, you know, if they don't qualify for a different free program. And it's just all about making it less confusing, right? Being more honest in the work. And doing the, yeah, doing the, I, I get like, there's marketers, there's people that have bottom line business results to deliver, mm -hmm. right? At every company. And it's very tempting to, and it's and it's not super unethical, but it's just not keeping things clear, right? And then somebody somebody thought they were signing up for the free, and next thing you know, they're spending one hundred and fifty dollars to get their simple tax return done that they thought they was they were doing for free. And this is just ethically wrong. I mean, it was wrong to be doing this. I understand why it ended up happening because there's always pressure from above to get more and more revenue. But but we're talking about people, by the way. We should remind everyone. The people who qualify for this free file program have to make adjusted gross income less than sixty nine thousand dollars in uh, twenty nineteen, sixty nine k or less. So, like these are not these are not people that are generally going to CPA firms to get their taxes done. They don't have the the money to pay for tax preparation, and they generally don't have a complicated situation. It's like a W two and some deductions, right? Some um, standard deduction. I was kind of thinking about it, like if the let's say the IRS does get in and builds their own product of some type, right? It actually could be better for somebody like Intuit because Intuit could just offer a TurboTax Live type service for the government program. Because if it's anything like the healthcare sites that were buggy and hard to use and nobody could navigate them, I imagine the IRS's tax one would be the same way, and they would just pay pay us two hundred dollars and we'll walk you through the process. <laughs> so. Using their site, so so I, it, it, they could still everybody could still make money even if the government built their own website. I'm going to revise my predictions from our last episode. <laughs> my prediction is that the IRS will not build their own free file program this year because they don't have the money. They still have the resources to do it. Yeah. Exactly. One more thing to add to this story is existentially, this is like let's say the IRS were to do that, which we know they're not, but if they were eventually to do that, this is a significant threat to into its uh, profits at TurboTax because a good chunk of their revenue is from the people who do qualify for free file. So it's unlikely, but you know, if the IRS did get its act together and make this thing, it, it, would, it would be a problem. And so I bring it up because an analyst at JP Morgan mentioned this specifically in a report from uh, JP Morgan to uh, investors. Well, it gets people in the door, right? It's free. The word free. It gets people in the door. And then the, the, there's also confusion because I think as soon as you have like business income or you have a, a, w, a 1099 or, or you have stock or anything like that, you don't qualify for that program. So I, I think there's just a lot of confusion because I think people go in. That, that's the problem, right? You go in thinking you're going to get something for free. And when it's done, you're paying 160 bucks. And that's the – I think that's – what if accounting firms are like, come to your taxes here for free? And then you do their taxes then you're like, sorry, you got to pay – to, to, to take this paper out the door, you got to yeah. pay now for that. Hey, so survey time. Accounting web. Good, because I have a survey too. Oh, you got oh, accounting web? Perfect. Okay, cool. Yeah, so accounting web did a survey of their readers. 500 responses were received, and the majority of the audience either own or manage a firm with 10 staffers or fewer. 82% of readers are in small firms, and they either own or manage them. So... They asked uh, some some questions. I'll, let's go through those results and talk about them. Uh, what services does your firm offer? Select all that apply. Over 80% of firms offer, no surprise, bookkeeping and tax preparation. About 75% of firms, three quarters, offer tax planning. Payroll is almost 70%. And financial reporting, it's uh, like 65% or so offer financial reporting, which not sure exactly what that means, but I take that to mean more than the bookkeeping, like the controller kind of level uh, financials uh, reports. Now, what is uh, surprising, that's not really surprising to me. What is surprising is that 60% of the respondents said they offer or perform business planning. Only 36% do cash flow forecasting and only 27% perform some form of technology consulting. So lots of opportunity to... Lots of opportunity for most firms to grow that cash flow forecasting aspect of the business and even the business planning because I, I hear stats every single year from all of the vendors talking about how businesses are always having trouble with cash flow. <laughs> cash flow is what puts 80% of businesses out of business even though they may be profitable. They just can't handle their cash. 
that is what services firms are offering. Seth Feinberg, who is the managing editor at Accounting Web, he was actually surprised, I think. He admittedly was surprised about the results because people were a little more technologically advanced, his readers, than he even thought they were. Um, and one of the indications was that was the um, almost 80% are claiming they're using some sort of online accounting software. Right. But the question I have is how many clients are on the online accounting software? If it's just one client and the rest are all on desktop, then... Does, is that really meaningful? Well, that's where hey, there's a secondary question a little deeper. And so about 18% of the firms are 100% cloud. Um, 60% are a mix, but still 20, almost 25% are 100% desktop stuff. What percentage are desktop? Because um, he doesn't have the exact number, but I followed the graph and made you know eyeballed it as straight as I could. And it looks like just almost 25%, maybe 24.9 or something. Are still all desktop. 100% desktop. Fewer than 20%. Yeah, I'm looking at the chart here too. It looks, could be like 18% or so are fully cloud, but then 60% are a mix. Let's, let's talk before we move on about the tech, the specific technologies that firms are using. Yes. yes. Uh, so right. we could take turns with this. Uh, it looks like, you know, we're looking at a chart here. We don't have the exact numbers, uh, but it looks like you know, slightly over 80% are using tax preparation technology. I don't know what they're doing if they don't use tax prep tech. Like, are they, Does that mean they're doing it on paper? So what was the percentage of that? They're like over 80% slightly, somewhere between 80 and 90%. I mean, maybe they, they don't do any tax at all. Maybe that's, that's what that means. They, 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 that's a, a no answer, but you're right. Like, what, what is the option here? And you mentioned that something like 80% are using online accounting, but a mix obviously of online and desktop is the primary uh, situation. Expense management is like just 30%. Yeah, that's was the, I was shaking my head. Like, how are accounts tracking their own internal expenses? Uh, Excel spreadsheets, probably. That's my guess. Just 30%? Like, this seems so, it seems crazy low. And we're talking, you know, Expensify or Receipt Bank for expense reports or, you know, whatever abacus, whatever you're using for that. Another one that is kind of shocking is workflow. Only 30% use a workflow technology. Although, if you're a sole proprietor, you can get away without having workflow software. Well, they have practice management too. So it, yeah, I think that's a great one. I think if, oh. if people are answering that, it's great, right? Because I think there's workflow practice management for your team, but then there's workflow, tell people like, you know, data capture, OCR type tools. Right, right. Like, it's great. Like, I don't think those were very easily answered questions. One that was very clear though is CRM. And only 20% say they use the CRM? Less, like, less than 20% are using CRM. How do they Instagram? track their customers? Like, what are people, if you have an accounting firm, how are you tracking your customers just in your practice management tool? Maybe? Yeah, probably. I mean, again, I think it would be interesting to segment these responses by the size of the firm because if you're a sole proprietor, a lot of this stuff's unnecessary. You, you generally don't need a CRM if it's just you. You can keep track of that in a spreadsheet or in your contacts or whatever. Or even, even I can look at the uh, Intuit Accountants Edition. Yeah. Or QuickBooks Accounts yeah, exactly. Edition. It has just good enough. All, everything you need to know about your client, you just keep in there. Yeah. Portals, less than 50% of clients of accounting firms use a portal. I would love to see the number of what percentage of their clients use the portal. <laughs> it's probably like 10%. And then reporting and dashboards, just over 30% are using reporting slash dashboards, which actually I think that's kind of exciting given that I work at Giraffe where we make reports and dashboards because it shows there's, uh, there's room to grow. This episode of the Cloud Accounting Podcast is sponsored by QuickFee. As you know, accounting firms don't have trouble getting paid. They have trouble getting paid on time. QuickFee allows your clients to pay outstanding fees in up to 12 monthly installments while your firm gets paid up front and in full. QuickFee was started by accountants for accountants with a mission to ensure that firms are never paid late again. For almost five years, QuickFee has been helping CPA firms reduce their outstanding AR. In fact, accounting firms that are partnered with QuickFee are seeing a minimum of 32% reduction in their AR. Think of your firm. What could you do with that additional operating capital? QuickFee is offering Cloud Accounting Podcast listeners waived signup fees, three free months, and quick setup just in time for your firm's busy season. To join the 1,200 CPA firms globally and over 20% of the top 200 U.S. accounting firms in benefiting from quick free payment plans, head over to cloudaccountingpodcast.promo slash quickfee. That is cloudaccountingpodcast.promo forward slash Q-U-I-C-K-F-E-E. -E. You've already done the work. QuickFee gets you paid on time. Want to do a kind of funny story? 
Yeah, let's let's to let's, lighten the mood a little. Let's lighten. Well, I yeah, let's lighten the mood. Okay, so remember we talked about uh, PayPal bought Honey, and we discussed that Honey is a browser add-on to your browser, and when you go anywhere shop, or actually every website you go to, if you're shopping, it goes and finds a code for a discount. It right. automatically sticks it in the shopping cart for you, so you get that code. So at some level, hey, great. But in order for an app to do that, they have to watch every single thing you do on the internet, right? Everywhere you shop, et cetera. Yeah, they, right? they, they scrape all of your data. They, they, they know so much about you. Yes. And, and, and it's okay if you and I on our podcast are like, hey, maybe Honey's not a great idea because we aren't in that business. But I think it's very funny when Amazon told users of Honey to uninstall it. Because obviously Amazon's the only one who's allowed to track how we shop on the face of the earth. <laughs> so I just was uh, shocked well, by this. Because uh, what, so why, why is Amazon not a fan of Honey? The obvious reason why is Amazon has their own Alexa plugin. They have plugins for browsers to track what you're shopping for on the internet already. Right. Like, they're getting in. That's the real reason. They're in Amazon's game, and Amazon doesn't want them in the game. Now they played it up as security, which yes, if you any browser extension you install, you have security risk. Yeah. And we talked about that with the Honey thing. You know, if you're if you're using that, and then you're doing your clients' books, Honey can see every web page you go to. So, well, let's let's keep on this privacy thing. Okay. This topic. So last week or two weeks ago, I should say, we talked about California's new privacy law. In our first episode of 2020, we talked about the new privacy law, the California Consumer Privacy Act that took effect January 1st. And we talked about the potential confusion because it's super, super broad and businesses aren't really sure what exactly they're going to have to provide and what the restrictions are on selling data and what even selling data means. Because now the law says that a consumer in California should be able to go to a website for your business and click a button that allows them to opt out of having their information sold. That's one of the provisions among many. And so we're not really sure what, what it means to sell information because it doesn't mean just exchanging it for money. It could also be exchanging it for some other benefit that is non-financial. And one sign that this is very confusing is that both Facebook and Google have taken completely different responses and interpretations of the law. Facebook says it's not going to change anything about how it acts. So the information that they share with third parties, they say, we're not selling it. So therefore, we can continue to do that even if somebody opts out of it because we're not selling it. Google has said they're going to completely agree to this and they're limiting the information that advertisers can reuse. They can only reuse, they can only use the information to advertise on Google's platform. They can't take that info and then you know add it to their own databases or something like that. That's at least what I took out of this article that was on uh, Fox and Hounds by Chris Reed. I saw another article related to uh, the California Privacy Act, but I I cut it. I didn't bring it with me this week. But essentially, it was really talking about the amount of money companies are spending to comply. Oh, yeah. It's got to be huge, right? right? It's huge numbers. But the interesting line in the article is uh, nobody really knows what what the compliance means. And so some companies are just opting out. They're going to wait until there's enforcement of it. There's like, we're not going to do anything until they start busting companies and we start seeing what it really means. And then on top of that, there also talks about how the state of California, it just doesn't even have the resources to chase and enforce this at this point. So it everybody's going to do whatever they want to do at this. It's, it's a wild west. And what we really need is for the attorney general, Javier Garcia, to create an enforcement framework. And they haven't even done that yet. So kind of probably a take a wait and see approach is going to be good. But to reiterate what we talked about at the beginning of the year, this is pretty big. Any business with $25 million or more in revenue or personal information on at least 50,000 people in California has to comply with this law, even if they're not in California. And so if you're an accounting firm and you've got data, or if you're, you've got more than 25 million in revenues and you've got information on Californians, if I ask you to provide me the information that you have on me, you have to send it to me and theoretically everything you've got on me. And then if I ask you to not, if I opt out of you sharing that information with other people or selling that information, I don't even know if you can do that with CPA regulations, but let's say you did, you can't do that anymore. And you've got to have a way for me to opt out of that. So big implications, um, and we, we still don't know. You cannot be in a business, and your biggest user base will be in California. Right. Right. Like you, so 
So everybody is subject to this. Well, if you're an, if you, if you're I mean, a national our, if you're a national business, you're going to have a lot of California users. Even ours, right? Our, our obviously our number one market is the United States, but California, our number of downloads we get from the state of California is bigger than any other country. Yep, it's like twenty percent of podcast. total downloads or something, right? Yeah. So 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 if you, and if you had any other business that is broad. Mm-hmm. You're going to have a huge amount of people in California, and so it's fifty thousand, right? Hitting that fifty thousand number in California is very realistic for a lot of businesses. So I'm hoping that eventually California does force Facebook to comply with this because I definitely do not trust Facebook with my personal information. You want to know why? <laughs> it's because of a specific incident that occurred last year that was reported in December in Bloomberg. Apparently. Personal banking information for tens of thousands of Facebook workers was compromised last month when a thief stole several corporate hard drives from an employee's car. The hard drives, which were unencrypted, included payroll data like employee names, bank account numbers, and the last four digits of employees' social security numbers. This is according to an email that Facebook sent out to its own staff last year. It also included- Well, they'll put them in, they'll put them in credit report monitoring for them. <laughs> I still get that. It also included compensation information, including salaries, bonus amounts, and some equity details. 29,000 employees who worked at Facebook in 2018. And this is all because an employee decided to take home these hard drives that are supposed to stay in the office and they were not encrypted. It's funny. The HR departments roll out these trainings at these big corporations about all the security and all this stuff to make sure they're in compliance. The biggest offenders based on my observation, are the people that work in the HR department. <laughs> They're sending unencrypted spreadsheets around with people's social because they actually are the ones with the sensitive data. Most – at a vast corporation, most people don't have access to sensitive data in any big way. Right. It's the HR department that does and they're the bigger they're, – they're the weakest link in this. Like they should just worry about their own department <laughs> and then that will secure the whole company. The company will be at less risk. Oh, God. It's just – it's so bad. Like, like just to be clueless and just take hard drives home like that. Like, I'm going to bring these home, work on them. So you know? <laughs> if, 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 the, if that is the uh, impact of Facebook's, you know, policies that they're, they can't protect the personal information of their own employees, imagine how loose they treat our data as their users. You know, you can get Firefox and have it out of the box. Firefox just blocks Facebook everywhere you go. It blocks their tracking. Just blocks it. Yeah. Blocks it map everywhere you go. Uh, well... One more California follow-up, and then I'll okay. turn it over to you for our next topic. I'll jump to New York City. That'd be a good, <laughs> a big swing at the other end of the coast. We'll do that. So the California Board of Accountancy is making some changes due to a new assembly bill that changed how they have to do business. I guess we have to pass a law for the California Board of Accountancy to do anything. And it's pretty revolutionary, David, I have to tell you. Starting in 2020, the newsletter that the CBA puts out called Update – must be posted to the CBA website and an email notification must be distributed to all licensees and applicants regarding its availability. I guess previously we didn't have an online form of the newsletter and it was only sent out by postal mail or something. I didn't even know that we had a newsletter. Here's the uh, next bit. Well, in order to make that happen, apparently we haven't been collecting email addresses. So now the CBA is going to request that by February 28th, 2020, everyone licensed or seeking to get a license in California, visit cba.ca.gov slash email and enters your license number PIN and register your email so that they can actually contact us via email because it's all been done by uh, postal mail. Well, this explains kind of the lack of CRM usage when the Cal CPAs do not have CRM, CRM with email addresses. Yeah. <laughs> Wow, that's that's shocking. So you so so you've been a member, yeah. But you had no idea they were sending out this paper. Tri, I guess it's a little trifold newsletter that's stapled in half. Or something. I don't even know. I don't. Re- I've never received it. Oh, by the way, they raised the annual fee, so now it's two hundred fifty dollars a year just to stay registered and licensed. Well, you should go demand your back newsletters that are missing. I know you paid for those. Well, you know, I wonder if the CBA is subject to the California Consumer Privacy Act. And I can just request all the information they have on me. I don't know. Which obviously is nothing because they don't have your mailing address to send you the newsletter. So it's nice and safe that way. All right, David, what's next? Uh, we can jump over to New York City. Okay. So New York City, as of January 1st, 2020, all the parking meters in New York City stopped taking credit cards. Why did they stop taking credit cards? Parkion, who is a mobility company, that's they basically build the software that these parking meters are running on. Good thing is, is this is what I noticed in the article. They did not say it was a glitch. There was good reporting, actually, 
you know, usually people are like, it's a glitch. And we and I talked about this yeah, there, before. There are no people glitches. Need to stop using glitch. There's no glitches. And they said it was caused by an anti-fraud security setting that disabled card payments beyond January 1st, 2020. So the security measure, which didn't allow you to process cards beyond a certain expiration date, they forgot to update it and all the meters stopped working. Is that what happened? That's what happened. So they have to manually update one meter at a time. Like this is not, you know, these meters aren't Wi-Fi or but connected to the cloud. But they have to be because they process credit cards, right? But I guess they don't have a wireless way to update the software. Update, yeah. Oh, God. Which is possibly good, right? Because then people would hack them and update the parking meters, right? right. Remote um, f- from afar. So it's probably good that they're not connected at that level and only the payments part's connected. But completely just a total brain fart. It's crazy. Hey, but you know, good news for New Yorkers, right? Because they all got free parking for a while. Oh no, people got tickets. Oh no. Because <laughs> uh, if you didn't have cash with, or you didn't have cash with you. Um, so, so maybe we're getting to a point in our society where you almost need to have some cash just hidden in your car, some emergency cash, because when things do go down, I, I think we, didn't, I'm not sure we talked about, it, but I think Venmo was down. Uh, right after the first of the year. Yep. And a lot of people that use Venmo to pay their rent couldn't pay their rent and it, it just had a lot of ripple effects. So yeah, it might be smart to start carrying, keeping some extra cash in the mattress. Oh God. Talking about glitches, right? Staying on that for a moment. And then also going back to that accounting web survey, there was uh, an interesting bit at the end of the survey, which we didn't mention earlier. So of those folks that are still using desktop applications, only 32% of them are hosting desktop. The rest are using it local. So like desktop hosting is, you know, less than a third of firms are using desktop hosting at this point. And I started thinking to myself, well, that makes no sense. Why wouldn't you, if you're going to stay on desktop apps, at least get the benefit of having it hosted in the cloud. And then I saw what's been happening at Thomson Reuters over the last few weeks. And I understand why, because starting... On December 31st, I believe this is when this started, maybe as early as December 30th, users of their virtual office service, which is a, I'm not that familiar with it, but it sounds like a just a way to host desktop applications that Thompson Reuters provides. But like maybe you have, because with the, with the term office, you get access to a couple different Thompson Reuters Reuters products yeah. all under one virtual terminal. Of exactly. Like so you host all your Thompson Reuters stuff, maybe some other stuff too, and virtual office, and you log in. And your computer acts like a terminal to this virtual office, to this hosted solution. Well, starting December 30th, I'm I'm on the status page, which we'll link to in the show notes. They started having problems where it was either unresponsive or people couldn't log in. It wasn't working very well. And I just am scrolling up this status page, which is like a blog for problems that they're investigating and then updates, which by the way, every single app should have to update people on the status. Scrolling up... They've continued to have problems and incidents every almost every day from December 30th to today. Currently, applications are not launching on Virtual Office CS. So that is like two weeks of downtime. And this is tax season. Completely mind-blowing that this could be happening. And I want to give credit to Jacob Oberlander for letting us know about this because he's a Thomson Reuters uh, virtual office user and like he said that it's just a disaster. I don't know if those were exactly his words, but it sounds like a disaster to me. Uh, he can't use Ultratax, File Cabinet, Outlook, Excel, Word. Can't work for the past two weeks. It's outrageous, he says. So he's 100% down because his hosting, it was not just, he was using to get his Microsoft Office hosted everything. and everything else. Everything. Oh, boy. Yeah. And he says, Thomson Reuters is a big company that has lost touch. They increase the price every year just by emailing you that the price is up. No innovation whatsoever. They did start some new program on VO, but that will not be usable for another few years. So thank you, Jacob, for notifying us of this. And if you're a, also a user of Thomson Reuters Virtual Office and you have been having issues, I want to know like what has been the impact on your firm. And so this doesn't surprise me that firms are continuing to host applications locally because like this is a risk that you just can't take. I could not take this risk as a firm. If I if I were hosting apps, I just I couldn't I couldn't work. So so are you saying that that if you just like with anything, you should have a a contingency plan. So yeah. you need to keep one machine at least at your office at a minimum that has all your apps ready to go. They're patched. They're ready in case you need to fire that up and 
do client work. Or work with a provider where you have a guaranteed backup system where like they can they've copied, they've got mirrored copies of everything so that if they're they have started having problems, you can just go to this other server. And is there any indication of what's going on? I mean, is this a ransomware thing and the word's not out yet? There's there... No, it looks like configuration issues. It's not really clear what is going on. Here, here's an email that uh, Jacob Oberlander forwarded me. It says, this was back on January 5th, by the way. Dear valued customer. By the way, valued customer is a terrible <laughs> way to greet your customers. <laughs> we have found the root cause of the virtual office CS service degradation and are confident that the actions we have implemented will ensure normal service performance moving forward. Also overconfident <laughs> because this was January 5th and they're still having problems January 11th. We understand and regret the disruption that this service degradation may have caused you. We appreciate your patience during the time our teams and technology partners spent working together, investigating the root cause and implementing the solution. What we know we encountered an unexpected and sporadic network performance issue that was not detected by our usual monitoring systems. It was difficult to identify this issue without a comprehensive troubleshooting exercise, which has now been completed. What we are doing, we are working with our technology partners to implement additional monitoring that would proactively detect an alert based on this network issue. As always, we will continue to perform network system and architectural analysis to further enhance your user experience and avoid further disruptions. And they close it out with stuff like, we're committed to helping you. We're grateful for your business. And then points people to the status update page, which is the only good thing about that communication is the, well, the fact that they are proactive and they are communicating is good. And it comes from a specific person uh, and they have a status update page is good. But like two weeks of downtime is just crazy. I'm surprised there's not more uh, rumbling about this. Well, you know, would surprise me, except when CCH went down for all that time, it was pretty darn quiet online. Like accountants are like really nice to software vendors when there are are. Problems. Is it just maybe personality as well? Like maybe 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 people that are using those products, their firms, they're just not out there on the social media sites and other places, kind of where all the cloud accounts are hanging out. Right, where we get upset and we know that if we make a lot of rumblings on online, then it'll, the vendors will take notes. They'll be like, oh crap, we can't let the press get a wind of this. <laughs> yes. So yeah, I think it probably the, the folks that are using this product, probably not as many online. So they're complaining right to each other perhaps, but we just don't hear about it. It's like the silent firms. No, I agree. Do you have anything? Um, I have three articles on uh, fintech versus banks, but I think maybe you jump into anything else you have first and then I can get into that mess. Well, let's see. Um, uh, since it since we're on the topic of taxes and tax season, 1099s are the big thing in January. CPA Trendlines did a survey asking how firms handle client 1099s. Some takeaways, some things I found interesting. Solo practitioners, 25% of them don't do 1099s at all for their clients. So I wonder, well, how do your clients get their 1099s done? Well, like they don't provide it as a service. They just tell them, yeah. sorry, I don't do that. Go find someone else. I guess, yeah. Okay. Which to me is kind of crazy because it's actually really a pretty easy service to provide. And you know, you can you can charge a good amount for it. It was always very profitable for me. Um, well, especially if you if you utilize some sort of app or technology stack. Right. And you just you just mark up whatever you're paying for that technology stack and just pump it through the system. A lot of payroll software does it. 42% of firms in 2019 used payroll software. 7% used income tax software. 36% used standalone W-2 and 1099 software. And only 15% used an online W-2 and 1099 filing platform. Examples include tax, 99, tax 1099, track 1099. Those are the ones I've used. Yeah. They work I'm gonna, great. I'm gonna, I, th I think I can do it from inside of QuickBooks Online this year. I only have to do two, so I'm going to uh, give it a run. I, I feel like if it's only two, it doesn't make sense to try to get data to a separate app to do it somewhere else. I'll just I'll just do whatever whatever QuickBooks will charge me to do it. I'm just going to do it inside of QuickBooks. Well, I'm one of them, right? So I'm going to yes. get to see this as the receipt. I need your W9. I still need your W9, sir. But you can request it via QuickBooks, right? I think I did months and months and months ago, Blake. I just don't know. Did I not respond? <laughs> you did not respond. I think it still says pending. Oh, no. Okay. Send me that again. And I'll, I'll see if there's a up. reminder. I'll see if there's a, a reminder. Yep. Okay. Uh, all right. So uh, why don't we talk about the fintech stuff? Fintech. So obviously this story every week, it's like my beat, right? Yeah, the, you're the, the fintech versus beat. versus fintech. Yeah. So I have three articles. Um, and the reason I really got into these articles was the titles. 
So the first title I'm going to read is uh, Inside the Chase Plan to Ban Screenscaping. Uh-oh, that would be very bad. Very bad. So this is uh, an article on bank innovation. And I actually clicked through the thing. This is going to be like this juicy behind the scenes like drama thing. No, basically it's uh, it's very straightforward. It's the uh, managing director of digital platforms at Chase said that they're tokenizing the customer's data in order to protect their financial information and they're striking deals, right? And we talked about this, how they struck a deal with Yodely a few weeks back. Uh, they've done deals with Intuit. And I think you, right now, I think if you're on QuickBooks Online or using Intuit's Mint product, you have, you've already gone through this transition where you've had to, you've been disconnected completely and you've had to connect through the Chase's API and that now you're tokened in. And in theory, you won't get disconnected mm. as well. And um, apparently there's already 3.8 million customers using this through this API. But ultimately, the reason they're banning it because they don't want to have third parties screen scraping. They don't want to have third parties um, copying and saving people's login information, mm. which essentially Plaid, right? These other services that exist and Intuit had their own, it has their own um, banking uh, feeds. You have Yodely. So they're very clear about this, right? They're going to keep banning these companies companies and blocking them. So so it's a little bit of a, there's a war here, a propaganda war, right? So I can expect my HubDoc account to stop fetching my bank statements from Chase this year at some point, right? That's what it sounds like. Because it already That's doesn't correct. work for Wells Fargo anymore. Yeah. And I and I actually think in Mint, Bank of America and Wells Fargo, Mint's very clear, like you have to reconnect in the next like 10 more days, I think I have, to use the new API connection or however it is so yeah so this is you're going to see more disconnects in the next five to six months than you've ever seen before because chase is not the other one that's bit blocking well let me ask you this okay if if you if if i told you hey go watch this 15 minute video and the title of the video was the opening open banking movement is inspiring consumers to ask who owns their banking data uh i would watch that because i'm a fintech nerd but who, what would you expect to see in that video? Um, would you expect to see a consumer wondering about their fintech data? I, I guess most consumers probably don't think about that, though. <laughs> or anybody questioning that? No. So this video, and this is where I said we're in a propaganda war. So this is on CNBC. Mm -hmm. There's a 15-minute video, which is essentially like a long infomercial for Plaid. Oh, God. Right. It's spun up as this um, cut, you know, the, like under the guise of open banking and consumers. But really, when you watch it, like this is just propaganda for Plaid. Maybe propaganda is a bit of a strong word. Maybe Plaid just has a really good PR team that pitched a reporter on this because it doesn't say paid content or anything. I really no. I checked. I checked. I checked for paid content. Yeah. So okay. obviously it was pitched, but it. But for 15 minutes, like, couldn't you find one consumer that says, I'm secure? I'm upset that I can't get my own bank data out of my bank? Like, well, so it's they did all from Plaid. Go. Basically, they interviewed the Plaid founder. Oh. And then they interviewed uh, somebody, uh, an investor in Plaid. Right. And then they interviewed some uh, Harvard fellow that is in the bank industry of some type who probably is on the board at Plaid. I did not investigate that, but it, it was, it's, it's propaganda. And so both sides that are in this fight, right? The banks, we're going to ban you. And on the other side, the people getting banned are, you know, yeah. we're defending you. And this is all inside baseball because the consumer, the end user has no clue what's going on other than, oh, all well, of a until sudden, their, Venmo until, doesn't work. Then, exactly. Until their or, software gets turned off. And same thing with accountants, right? Accountants, we really, most accountants who are using QuickBooks Online or Zero or online accounting, like when we connect the bank feed, we don't know what's going on behind the scenes. We don't really think about No, but that you- or, as the account or bookkeeper looks like the jackass right. when it disconnects because then you have to go back to your client and say, I need you to log in again. Do -do -do. And right. then you, know, you look like the incompetent accountant. It's horrible. Well, and that's why my solution was always, I never had my clients connect the feeds. I would have them create a read-only login for me. And then I would use that login to connect whatever feeds I needed. So that way, if it broke, I could just go in and reconnect it myself. If that's a bank that lets you do that. Well, and what I had to do, which was kind of painful, is I had to stop working with clients who didn't have a bank that would create a read-only login. If they couldn't do that, I wouldn't even take their administrator login. I wouldn't let them give me their login because I couldn't take the chance that, you know, that gets stolen or yeah. And I know there's accounts of bookkeepers that, you know, they have this in a quick base, they're 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 
they're storing this from their clients. Yeah. It's definitely a broken system. And that brings me to my third article. So this is an article in AmericanBanker.com. And the title of the article is, it's time to go all in on open banking. And this article is part one of a four-part series. So I'll summarize each one as they come out. Uh, I would argue this article right now is like an APIs 101 doc for somebody that's a banking executive or a banking manager. Which would make sense because that's who the audience is for American Banker, right? Banker, yeah. yeah. But I think our, our audience, like if you want to understand more of how this kind of works and how in theory it could be solved, I think this article is a very lightweight for you to understand APIs in general. I thought mm -hmm. it was pretty good. And they talk about microservices, right? So an example of microservices would be when you go to like Amazon and maybe you can still shop but maybe the reviews aren't working, right? So, so the whole website is built from small pieces called microservices, mm -hmm. right? And, and then they reference in the article about Jeff Bezos' famous mandate from the early 2000s. Are you aware of what this mandate is? Oh, that everything at Amazon had to be billed as its own service with an API. So another team could use it. So whatever piece of the product you built, you'd build it in a way so other teams could consume it. And then eventually you'd have it consumable externally. Well, and the modern way of building apps, if you want that, is you build the API first and then you build your app as sitting on top of that API. Yes. Rather than the other way around. Which would be, we've talked about that before, like that's how Twitter was made and that's how Square was built on, Square was built that way. It was right? an API first and then the interface was added. And so he lays out in the article about like, this is just a simple plan. This is how they transition to open banking. It's very clear, right? And he talks about how, hey, if you don't open up it to APIs, you're going to go obsolete. But my experience, this takes a long, 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 long time, especially if whatever it is you have was never designed to be open to begin with. And example I can give on this was PayCycle. So uh, Bill.com, Rene LeCert, you had a payroll company called PayCycle, and Intuit purchased it. It's probably going on a dozen years ago, maybe 13 years ago. It could be 14 now, like time's flying, right? It was never de built, designed to have an API. 13 years later, guess what QuickBooks still doesn't have it available as a public API? There is no payroll API still. Oh, because PayCycle became QuickBooks Online Payroll? That's correct, right? But if something wasn't built from day one to have APIs, it's very hard to add an API on top of it. Well, it's like trying to add plumbing to a building that never had it put in in the first place. Exactly. Because there's security. There's just so much involved. And so this simple plan, like just do what Jeff Bezos told his Amazon employees to do. I don't know. Will we ever have open banking? In Europe, they're starting to have it because of the legislation. I think that unless we have some sort of legislation, not that I'm a big fan of legislation, <laughs> You know, given what's happened in California, but you know, maybe something to force portability of information uh, would would inspire the banks to actually build it. Or, or easier way is just loosen up who can get a bank charter and let the free market figure it out. Yeah, that's let, the best scenario. Let the challenger banks come in and build this from the ground up, and yeah. and and have all these connections. That's great. Hey, well, David, we're running out of time. That's it. So, if people want to catch up with you, get to know you, talk to you, send you stuff like Jacob did to me, you know, where can they reach you? The easiest place is on Twitter. I'm just at David Leary there, but you can also on Facebook find me the same way and on LinkedIn the same way. Yep. And I am at Blake T. Oliver. And for those of you who are not on the socials, feel free to email me at Blake at BlakeOliver.com. Time for the classifieds. Looking to modernize your firm? Ryan Lanzanis started and sold his own accounting firm in just five years. Now he helps firms like yours stay on the cutting edge. Get access to his free weekly email curating the top five pieces of content that will help your firm modernize by visiting futurefirm.co slash cloud accounting. That is futurefirm.co slash cloud accounting. Want to get the word out about your newsletter, webinar, party, Facebook group, podcast, or that fancy Excel macro you just created? Why not let the listeners of the Cloud Accounting Podcast know by running a classified ad? Hit the show notes for the link to get more info. 